Welcome to Talking Tuesday. I am your host, Fancy Quant, and today we have a great guest. We have Dr. Peter Carr. So welcome to the channel, Dr. Carr. Hey, Dimitri. It's good to be aboard. So let's just dive in here with who you are. Why don't we just go through your background as a quick introduction? Sure, my pleasure. All right, well, I'm presently a professor at NYU. Um, so I'm in the uh, Tandon School of Engineering. Um, we have within that uh, engineering school, a department that's called finance and risk engineering, and I'm the department chair. So I've been department chair for four years. So before that, I spent 20 years uh, in the financial industry, uh, all in New York. So I worked at uh, three different places. Um, so started at Morgan Stanley in 96, um, went to Bank of America around the year 2000, went to Bloomberg after that, and went back to Morgan Stanley. So did a round trip in 2010 and then left for NYU around 2000, early 2016. So, um, so um, before I went to, the, um, went to Wall Street, I was a professor at Cornell University in upstate New York in Ithaca uh, for eight years. And um, for that, a PhD from UCLA. Um, and for that, um, an MBA and a Bachelor of Commerce degree from University of Toronto. And we won't go back to high school. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So were you, are you originally from Canada and then you yes. decided to move to the U.S.? Yeah, that's right. I'm Canadian, um, although I'm also a U.S. citizen right now. Um, so um, I left uh, Toronto uh, after an MBA in 83 and uh, went to UCLA. Um, so when I was thinking about doing a finance PhD, um, I really, I only applied to um, three schools, all in uh, California, because I was tired of Toronto weather, basically. And, uh, you know, I had a pretty good uh, GMAT score, so I knew I'd get into at least one. And, um, yeah, I, I got into UCLA and Berkeley, and, um, and um, I, my, I conferred with a professor at U of T who thought UCLA would be a good choice, so that's where I went. And... Um, so, um, so once I was in the U.S., I realized it's, uh, it's quite, a, you know, quite an amazing country. I still think so. Uh, I think you'll find most immigrants like me love the U.S. even more than uh, people born here, you know. Yeah. So, um, so I had no reason to leave, and I didn't. So I, uh, I stayed after that. And um, after, um, I mean, so I, um, after September 11th, actually, I thought, uh, maybe things would change with the open border between Canada and the U.S. Actually, I mean, terrorists were actually crossing from the Canadian border. So I um, applied for U.S. citizenship and got it shortly afterwards. And um, so um, I'm uh, um, proud to be here. And, uh, um, you know, it's uh, no plans to go back. <clears throat> OK, so I got to ask you this. So I started off in a background in finance, as you know, you started off in finance and you went to the MBA. What made you, did you think that getting the PhD was just a continuation of that finance journey? Or were you planning on shifting into quantitative finance as a whole? Did you see that as like a, an upcoming trend or kind of what's the background um, on that? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I got introduced to finance in my third year of a Bachelor of Commerce degree at University of Toronto. And um, I didn't really know what it was until then. And, um, you know, what, you know, I, what appealed to me about it was just that it was applying math. And um, I always loved math. So I love to see it applied. And um, sure enough, it was, and it was, you know, I mean, it was like, I learned portfolio theory and I could see quadratic forms being used to calculate variances of portfolios. And I thought, wow, that's, that's really cool. So, so anyway, um, I actually, after getting this Bachelor of Commerce degree, I actually went and spent a year at um, the predecessor PwC called uh, Coopers and Librand, one of the predecessors. And, um, and anyway, so I ticked and bopped as we call it. It's, it's a term for auditing for a year. And um, I it was like, uh, not much fun, to be honest. And not very intellectual. <laughs> so I realized, you know, hey, maybe uh, this finance subject that I like so much, maybe it's worth getting deeper into. So I went, I went and got an MBA majoring in finance. And um, Luckily, if I went to U of T where I did my undergrad, it would only take a year. So, so instead of the usual two, so I did it that way. And, um, you know, I realized in that year that, you know, indeed finance is a great topic. So, 
so I did apply to those three California schools and, and, um, and then, you know, went off to UCLA with the idea of getting a, just a finance PhD, not quantitative finance per se. Okay. All right. So, you know, so, I mean, uh, the PhD I got was in the Anderson, was now called the Anderson School of Management, although when I got there, it wasn't yet named. And, um, you know, the finance professors there were like top of the field, as I was told. And, but they weren't like, let's call them quantitative finance professors. They were superstars in like mainly empirical finance, actually. We used to joke that UCLA was the University of Chicago at Los Angeles. Uh, there were many <laughs> University of Chicago um, PhDs there on the faculty and it was you know, mostly empirical but my own interests sort of did tend to the quantitative so in my second year I took an option pricing class taught by a, um, a, a guy who had a PhD in both physics and finance and um, you know I started to realize hey this is like fun stuff so so when I came out on the job market I had several offers it um, I chose a place which was Cornell which was sort of known to be fairly quantitative Mm -hmm. And in particular, there's a professor there, Bob Jarrow, is well known in quantitative finance. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so I went there, I mainly work with him. And when I was there, uh, luckily enough, this guy named David Heath was there in the operations research department. And he's like the Heath and Heath Jarrow Morton. He's, he was very quantitative. Um, so I started to really get into it. And it was really fortunate I went there because um, actually, like, um, Heath and Jarrow decided to just offer a uh, Sort of a class on quantitative finance, you know, aimed at doctoral students. But like, I was actually not that quantitative at that time, even though I had the finance PhD. So I took the class and um, it really opened my eyes to how deep a field it was. And I was sort of lucky to be um, learning quantitative finance when it was just getting off the ground. So um, so this would be. 1988 ancient history, but the first uh, math finance or quantitative finance conference was actually at Cornell in 88, my first year there. And, um, you know, it was actually kind of a watershed event. There's a photo of all the participants standing on the steps of what's called Malat Hall. And it's got some of the, you know, superstars of quantitative finance there. Uh, Fisher Black was there. Um, and, uh, you know, other big names like Steve Shreve and Kerry Back. And, you know, it was, it was also kind of a nice mix of um, sort of business school finance professors like Jero, but also pure math people as well. Okay. So like, like Shreve and Karatsas, for example, they were both there. And Chifu Huang, who's actually a finance guy, but is known for his, his, his math skills. So... So anyway, it was it was a really good event, and um, so that uh, from that point on, I basically realized that quantitative finance was the area I wanted to be in, and um, you know, so so um, so I worked in it, and um, you know, sort of one thing, Ithaca is not that far from New York City, four hour drive, and uh, I had a girlfriend who lived in Manhattan, so I was in Ithaca. Or sorry, I was in Manhattan, to see her, and so one thing led to another. I started consulting for for various firms. Um, one firm that did FX options software, for example, and needed someone to just figure out how to price barrier options. And so I, um, I ended up, you know, consulting and liking it. So um, I spent a summer in my, I spent the sec, like, so when you're in academia, you're basically supposed to, you know, keep your nose to the grindstone, publish papers and work towards tenure. And, you know, while I realized that was the game, I did also realize that there's a great big world out there beyond academia. And um, so, um, and my, um, in the summer after my second year at Cornell as a professor, I got an offer to be a sort of an intern at Susquehanna, uh, which is a pretty well-known options trading firm, the Susquehanna Investment Group. And they're located in Philadelphia. Well, more precisely, uh, Bala Kinwood. And um, so anyway, so I went there for the summer, which was a bit unusual for a professor to do, but I realized I was kind of naive when it came to the real world at that point. And um, it really helped me to sort of understand exactly where, you know, what works and doesn't work with the theory. And um, so when I came back, it was, um, I was a, a different person really. Um, so my teaching ratings improved. And um, I also had all these, you know, connections now to to industry. So I started to send my better students to Susquehanna and um, the, um, you know, and just in general, be more in touch, started speaking at industry conferences. 
And, um, you know, by the time, you know, know, 96 came around, um, I was dating a woman who's now my wife and she was graduating and uh, this Ithaca is pretty small. So, so we, we moved to, we moved to Manhattan. And um, so I joined Morgan Stanley in their equity derivatives group. And, um, you know, at that time, like exotics were hot and, um, you know, things like barrier options, but also cliques, forward start options, um, compound options, exchange options. So, so anyway, so um, I started as a VP, uh, which is an industry, like you probably know there's four levels in banks. So this was the second lowest level. So they sort of gave me some credit for, for eight years as a professor, but not too much credit, which is fair. I mean, I, I thought that was fair. And, um, so, um, and um, you know, it, it was my first year in industry at Morgan Stanley. It was just like completely eye-opening. I mean, it was just like, there, I realized that in my area, you know, which was options, it, they were so far ahead of happy media. So, so, I mean, it was a really good equity derivatives place and it still is. And um, so I learned a lot and, um, you know, and then let's say um, I just kind of like the way I would describe my 20 years in on, on the street is, you know, I would stay, let's say somewhere between five and 10 years at a place, but then move. And, um, you know, often it was always when I moved, it was like um, a diagonal move, I'd call it, meaning it was like upper rank. And, um, and maybe in something slightly different, you know, so, so Mm -hmm. I, I kind of didn't want to get completely pigeonholed in, let's say equity derivatives where I started. And, um, and often it would be to a place that let's say wanted to do what I was currently doing, but, you know, let's say their bread and butter was actually something else. So it meant that I could learn their bread and butter while contributing. So, um, so that, um, you know, kept, that's basically every time I switched, I moved up a level. So I started the second lowest level, but then when I went to Bank of America, I was at the third lowest, or sorry, the, um, I went the wrong way. Sorry, the, well, upper rank, upper rank. Yeah. And then to Bloomberg, they don't really have those levels. But when I went to Morgan Stanley, I was an MD, and um, which is managing director of the top level. And then anyway, um, and then, um, you know, I guess I was leading a pretty big, quant group called market modeling um about 70 people in four different offices around the world um and it was very time constrained okay like um you just have no time and uh Mm -hmm. you know so when i started the role in 2010 i mean i basically did nothing but you know respond to email and meet people for a year and um it was kind of like not so satisfying so um, so a friend of mine named Attilio Mucci, he had, he sent me an email just sort of asking a technical question. And, um, like to my surprise, I spent the next three days trying to answer his question, ignoring everything else. <laughs> and, you know, it was like, uh, it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was just, you know, so, so I kind of at that point realized it's, I'm really an academic at heart. Um, I didn't mind, you know, the, you know, the high pay and also just the high quality of people around me, um, you know, that you see on Wall Street. And um, so, so I stayed for quite a while after that. But anyway, when NYU made me an offer in, in 2016, I took it. Um, it was a um, tenured offer, which I knew was important um, if you're going to have mm-hmm. any kind of voice in how the program is going to, you know, proceed. And it was a department chair as well. So, so anyway, so it was a good offer. So I figured I, you know, 20 years is enough. And um, I, uh, you know, you can, there are people who just want to rake in as much cash as they possibly can, but I'm not one of those people. So, so um, I am pretty happy with uh, the move. So that was four years ago. And um, anyway, um, we've, um, you know, I changed the program quite a bit from when I first joined it. When I first joined it, for example, accounting was a core class, and I thought that was a bit strange for a client finance program. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I actually have an accounting undergrad degree. I mean, I know the field. It's not like you know, it's and it it has its place, but it's just I didn't think quant finance was one of those places. So, so, 
So I got rid of that and later replaced it with machine learning, uh, which, you know, I think does. Yeah, that's a good decision there. Yeah. 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 And that really helps students get jobs. Um, you know, so we used to have summer courses, for example, but we, we, I brought in a placement person, which is extremely important, I think, and she did a good job placing everybody. So there was actually nobody to take those summer courses. So we dropped them. <laughs> and, uh, that's know, a good problem to have though. <laughs> yeah, that's a good problem to have. Yeah. Um, so, and um, I moved us onto online pretty early on, like well before COVID. Um, and um, that turned out to be fairly prescient given that last spring, everything was online. Mm -hmm. And um, so, um, so we're, you know, and I guess um, I spend time now, you know, I do try to think about future higher education, especially just for quant finance. This is all I really care about, to be honest. And, um, and um, you know, there's, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting future. I mean, you know, the stuff I'm known for is like, let's say not at the top of the heap, like it used to be. Obviously machine learning is kind of like, um very valued nowadays but it's also a very broad nebulous <laughs> term that yeah. um you know let's say applies to lots of fields and the specific application to quantum finance you know needs to be further fleshed out let's say so it's an interesting research area to go into for sure and um you know it also let's say has a lot of promise um but you know also let's say a lot of pitfalls and i know you've you've done videos on this. <clears throat> so, so anyway, so that's a long answer to your question, which was, uh, I think it started, how did I get interested in quantitative finance? But um, anyhow, that's- Yeah, uh, no, it's interesting because, so I, I'm always envious of like you and Emmanuel Derman. Okay. Because I really like the fact that you guys have been able to both skate the professional industry world as well as the academic world. Yeah. And I think- true it takes a very unique person to be able to do both halves. You have to have the scientific like curiosity and research to really dive into one topic and spend, you know, months or years doing research, writing papers and putting in more or less like those quiet hours behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. When flip side out in the industry, right? Everyone wants to be excited and thrilling and like, you know, you're making money and you're pushing it for the business. And I see myself in a lot of ways as that struggle, which is like, I like the industry as a whole and I, I enjoy the money part and it's mm -hmm. great. Yeah, but there's always part of me that always wonders if I should go back for that PhD and kind of step away from the industry more so to do do more of the research. Like I enjoy I enjoy doing the research and the academics, and a lot of times that gets put to the wayside in the industry. Like it's we're here to make money, we're not here to write research. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so you know, just to on that point, I mean, you know, I. Um, almost never reported to a PhD when I was on Wall Street. I was always reporting to people with <laughs> either a master's or a bachelor's degree. So like, it's not a prerequisite, you know, to be, to do well in uh, industry. It's, um, you know, and honestly, I mean, it, unless you're like specifically doing quantitative research, I mean, it's just unnecessary, you know? So, um, and you know, you can still manage quantitative research groups even without a PhD. And that's happened all over the place in the financial industry. So um, so it's not a prerequisite is point number one um, <clears throat> to be successful on Wall Street, that's for sure. Um, and um, I think, you know, the, the really the reason to do it is to you know, finally say to yourself, okay, I'm, you know, I've learned most of some field and I'm now at a stage to contribute back to it. And if you feel that's important, then it's a good thing for you to do. But if you don't, which is actually just dies most people, then, uh, you know, you shouldn't. Okay. So, <clears throat> so um, that's my sense. Um, actually, it's interesting you bring up Emmanuel Derman because I met him early on in my career. We met when I was a professor at Cornell and um, I really liked the fact that, you know, he was on the industry side and publishing. OK, so he was publishing in, in you know, in industry journals, which is fine. And, um, you know, I thought, thought, well, you know, that's kind of amazing that you can, you know, be in the real world, so to speak, and yet um, publish, you know. So so I, I basically mimicked him. Uh, so I, I, you know, a few years later, I, I, other than him, I went to 
went to a big bank and um, did the same thing as him, which was published from from industry, which is not very easy to do, as you probably know, Mm -hmm. meaning it's not easy to do for several reasons. Like it's first, um, you know, there's all kinds of corporate governance issues at the the bank of the hedge fund where they're saying, why are you giving away the company's secret sauce? And, you know, you have to navigate that. (laughs) And on top of that, you know, you do kind of like learn what is actually important and what's not actually important. And so you tend to just focus on what you think is important, which not everybody shares. Okay, so like the referees in particular won't necessarily share your perspective, right? So, I mean, you know, a concrete example, I, uh, I've written a lot of papers with this guy, Lauren Wu, who's an academic, and like it really helps me that I co-author with an academic because he knows what they care about more than I do. And, um, and um, so we would, you know, I would basically tell him okay, a bit the secret sauce, but not specific to the company. So just more what the industry was doing, not Mm -hmm. the company per se. And, um, you know, and let's say academics had no clue. And so we, you know, we'd submit the paper thinking, you know, you should get in first round because this is, you know, what's used and it's been successful. Why would you reject it? And it would be rejected for, you know, for not sort of addressing what is felt to be important in academia. So I mean, a concrete example was, we built, you know, we had a way to build an applied vol surface that was actually being used in industry as a whole. And, um, you know, we submitted it to uh, one of the top four finance journals in like, which are Journal of Finance, GFQA, GFE, and uh, RFS. And anyway, it got rejected because they said, where's the economics? You know, where's the uh, intuition? And uh, so, you know, so we had to, re- we, they left the door open a crack and, um, we rewrote it to sort of emphasize um, the sort of um, what's called the uh, sort of um, the risk aversion side of things, like like looking at things under P not Q, and um, sort of talking about um, let's say how preferences of so-called markets, you know, could be viewed which nobody cares about in industry. Okay. I mean, like, you know, like as far as, you know, you build a good implied ball surface, you're done. And, um, you know, why let's say an option is priced different from P expectation is sort of not of concern, honestly, for most market making firms. And, um, so, um, but anyway, academics care. So we had to address it. So, so it's, um, you know, it's kind of like, that's why it's hard. I could say you have it's it requires two brains, and um, like mm-hmm. honestly, like if you want to be successful publishing from industry in academia, you're going to need to co-author with an academic. It's just too hard for an individual to do alone. Right. Do, do so, you see any way of bridging that gap? Because on my side, I see a lot of frustration where it's like when we go to hire people, I get mm-hmm. all these students from academia, and they're vastly underprepared. Yeah. And then we have to train them, which is fine. And then we have, if somebody quits, then you got to go find someone else. But we're constantly retraining people. And then on the yeah. flip side of that, now, my big criticism, everyone always complains on me is they say, you know, Dimitri, you're, you're too academic. You're too by the book. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I'm trying to get you... people to do the right thing here. And there's yeah. been books, there's been books written. I mean, a lot of firms are making dumb decisions and they don't fully understand the foundational principles, you know, like asset pricing or even like basic econometrics or statistics but it's like part of my career is trying to like I guess mentally grasp how do you get the academic side to work with the industry side there definitely seems to be that divide where it's like you can't explain to each half like if you work together we might be able to push the industry a little further yeah I agree about the divide and um, I mean you know as a concrete example like I mentioned those four journals that um, you know basically is publish a parish for finance professors in business schools um if you in a top business school you publish in those journals or you're out and um those journals you, you just don't even see on the trading floors of banks and so on right like right. uh you know I, I mean you could ask the leadership of all the large banks to name one of these four journals and they wouldn't give you wouldn't know <laughs> okay i mean it's just like it's just you know amazing to me how divorced the two worlds have gotten and um, 
So in the group I was leading at Morgan Stanley, like I mentioned, 70 people, I was the, I and another guy were the only two finance PhDs actually, and the rest were mostly PhDs in other fields, especially like physics, computer science, engineering, math. And um, so let's say, you know, you do have to teach them, that's true. And um, the, um, you know, you also have to kind of, in a way, get them to unlearn some stuff. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so um, like market efficiency, for example, like, you know, you, you know, if you hire someone from University of Chicago in particular, you know, it's sort of drummed into their head that markets are always forever perfectly efficient. And, um, you know, it's just, you know, if they're, if they're if the role is to actually find inefficiencies, which is not that hard when you know you have enough data and enough training, you know they're just sort of wondering why the you know they have to just basically believe that there's that <laughs> why, you know, why are we here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, so um, it's well, you know, and it like for example, I sometimes laugh when I go to an academic conference, and they'll find that you know, lo and behold, um, if you're you know, careful with machine learning, you could, you know, let's say, find trading strategies, which historically, because that's all you can ever do, were profitable, you know, but even going out of sample, so at least it's a valid test. And, um, you know, and then like, <laughs> an academic says, so there must be a hidden risk factor that explains these excessive returns, <laughs> you know, so, so that's like the, the conclusion that they would make, not that, you know, market is inefficient, and, it hasn't, you know, adopted this latest, greatest technique, right? Right, so right. You know, um, <clears throat> I, I mean, so part, of, part of that struggle too, I think is from the economic side. So having a master's in econ, you're right. That everyone has yeah. to, they have to have this, this world that's a complete theory. Everything has to be completed. And it's hard for them to step back right. and say, you know, people aren't rational. I mean, it, it's great to say the majority of people are rational, but there's always people on the fringes or people that are using some technique you don't understand and they seem really irrational to you. But from their yeah. perspective, right, they're just making money and kind of doing their own thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so, you know, some of the more recent Nobel prizes that went to say Thaler and earlier um, to, to, I guess it was Kahneman, you know, have helped to, um, you know, let's say make, behavioral finance more respectable, let's say, in academia, and uh, which is, you know, accepts on the pre accepts the premise that the market as a whole can behave irrationally. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and then, of course, the financial crisis, you know, I think was a signature moment for, for that. I mean, um, and so, but, you know, even after, right after the financial crisis, I did see various, you know, highly esteemed academic professors say, oh, the market was entirely rational throughout the whole episode, you know, which like, I find completely, you know, impossible to fathom. And um, so anyway, um, the, um, you know, the, and I think those Nobel prizes were in fact given for not for showing individuals that are irrational because everybody agrees on that, but that the whole market is. And, um, you know, so, so um, they were well-deserved. I actually, when I was at Cornell, I happened to overlap with Thaler before he went to Chicago. And um, he would, he's a very impressive guy. I mean, he, I remember, you know, he was like giving a talk to the finance department at Cornell, which was me, Bob Jero, and three others. And we were all like, you know, steeped in the same thing, you know, the same orthodoxy you're referring to of completely efficient markets, blah, blah, blah. And he was presenting a paper of his style, which was showing you know, a systemic inefficiency. And so I remember, you know, telling him that, because I was of that school, you know, University of Chicago at Los Angeles, I, I remember telling him that, um, you know, maybe it's just this completely rational explanation for his results. And to my surprise, he stopped, he wrote it down and he said, you know, I'm going to check this out. Okay. And like, I thought, man, this is a scientist, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. you know, I was attacking his central thesis and, you know, he said, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Let me write this down and check it out. <laughs> so, so, you know, I was so impressed with him when he did that. So um, anyway, it's um, so that's, you know, it's, it is kind of, it is a fascinating tension between, 
orthodox economics and um, real world finance. Um, you know, I mean, I had nobody in my group with a, a PhD in economics. And even though that can get fairly mathematical depending on the field. Um, so, um, so I think if you went through four years minimum with that orthodoxy being drummed into your brain, you're going to be completely useless for the role I was, you know, involved yeah. in. Um, you can still find a place in forecasting, let's say, and, you know, so there are economists employed by banks, PhDs in economics, but, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of, and, you know, they can be fairly successful and influential, but they're not only if they have an open mind. <laughs> let's right, say. Right. right. They live in too much of a utopian, everything's got to add up kind of world. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, um, so anyway, it's, um, I think, um, you know, so obviously your channel's aimed at, uh, mostly at, I think, um, people who either want to get masters or currently doing masters. And, and um, I think that you do a great job showing them what lies on the other side before they actually see it for themselves. And, um, you know, they, it may, depending on where they're going, they may not get that anywhere else, you know? So um, if you're in a master's program in a financial capital like New York or London or Tokyo or Hong Kong, then you, you, there's other ways to see what's going on besides YouTube. But, um, you know, if you're in, let's pick on Iowa, <laughs> I'm just thinking it's hard, right? So, um, yeah. So, <clears throat> and um, so, um, so I think it's terrific that you can, you know, let people know that in advance, let's say, what is used and what isn't used in what they're learning. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So what have you done with the NYU's program? I mean, it's, it's come up through the rankings, obviously, online. It's been getting more, more famous and popular. I, what have you done to help address kind of that issue with getting more of an industry perspective on? Yeah. Well, coming from industry, I'm a big believer in using practitioners to teach. So, so we have um, you know, most of our courses taught by practitioners. And, um, you know, they're let's say I had a long Rolodex after 20 years. So I called on a lot of <laughs> friends uh, to start teaching in the program. You know, people I thought highly of who were a little like me, um, let's call it, you know, closet academics who would enjoy um, going back to the classroom. And um, so that was a big part of it, I would say. Um, I mentioned changing the focus a little bit. So the program I inherited was basically an MBA with a little bit of math, um, it, um, you know, it was, it was too broad, I thought. It was like, you know, classes like accounting are sort of fringe to quant finance. So, so like I said, I dropped it and as a core class, it's still an elective. And, um, and um, you know, also definitely glommed onto the whole machine learning uh, mania, which, you know, I could see already it was happening before while I was still in industry. And, um, you know, also, let's say, you know, emphasized, to, especially to the people there, that the sole role in some ways of a master's degree is to help students get a job in industry, not prepare for PhD, not prepare mm -hmm. even for, let's say, having a solid foundation when they're somehow later the CEO of the company. It's actually, let's say, much more short term focused. And um, so, you know, obviously you need to have courses in the areas where firms are hiring, which as we know is, is not just sexy things like machine learning, but also less sexy things like risk management. So, and um, you know, which is still very interesting and um, you know, very important. So, so, um, so we, I introduced a lot of courses that were basically kind of much more uh, down to earth and on um, things that people were actually focused on, including like things that were just kind of like becoming kind of hot in, in banks. So for example, like one nice thing about NYU's program is it's got size. So it's got scale. So I remember, you know, I remember, I remember having a breakfast with, um, Dan at Baruch, who's a sort of a competitor, and he runs a small program in Karant, where I came from, which is the NYU math department, was also a small program. And so he was sort of extolling the virtues of small programs. And um, I was saying, no, actually, honestly, scale is like 
is descriptive of some of the more successful MBA programs um, because, you know, you know, and you can ask why. So why is it like, so Harvard and Wharton's, you know, so, which is at Penn, why are those MBA programs, you know, so well known and, you know, successful? And part of it is scale. Like, so they, they've basically been around a long time with many graduates. So they have a huge alumni base that they can draw on for helping with placement and just training as well. And, um, you know, but also they could, with, with scale, you can have courses in the curriculum that are kind of niche, you know? So if you offer, like, for example, right off the bat, when I arrived in NYU, we offered a course in cryptocurrencies, okay? And, uh, you know, because mm -hmm. at Morgan Stanley, I was actually on a committee investigating both cryptocurrencies and quantum computing. And, um, you know, and these were sort of thought at the time to be just sort of up and coming technologies we should be aware of. So I thought, you know, let's make sense to have courses on it. And, um, but if you're a small program with like, let's say at most 40 students in the entering cohort, then you offer a cryptocurrency course and you might, not all the students are gonna be interested and you might get only four students taking it and that's not enough, that's not economically viable to run. Right, so right. when you have scale, like we're typically 150 entering class, then you can, you know, then it's viable to have these sort of fringe courses. So we did offer cryptocurrency classes. We offered course in, um, in automatic differentiation, which is like, used as a fringe thing to calculate sensitivities or Greeks. We offered a course in like using cloud computing um, to, you know, which, especially for calibration because it then can be done a lot quicker when you take advantage of what Amazon, Google and Microsoft have to offer in the cloud. And um, so we were able to offer these sort of fringe classes, which, you know, would actually help some students just get summer internships uh, because often a summer internship is sort of a flyer by the bank on, you know, on a project that maybe it'll work out and maybe it won't. Yeah. And um, so, you know, so it, it gets them in the door and then it's up to them to turn it into a return offer. Um, so anyway, so, so I'd say curriculum changing was a big part of it, emphasis on practitioner teaching and um, also, you know, short-term focus. Um, I brought in a placement director. There wasn't one prior. It was a woman who headed quant recruiting at Morgan Stanley. And uh, she's been a big help for, for getting us up in the ratings because the ratings, as you probably know, are very heavily focused on placement. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I understand. It's actually part of my philosophy too. Um, so, you know, so, but, you know, if you're, if you're kind of a, a tenured professor who doesn't really care about whether students get jobs, then because you know you have your job, then um, you're not going to go up in the rankings, right? And right. Um, you know, I mean, honestly, the, I remember when I got when I arrived at NYU, I met with the dean at the time, is not the dean now, and I said, "Do you know what the placement rate last year was?" <laughs> and uh, he said, "No," and I don't care. And I was like, I was shocked. <laughs> okay, and you know, I was shocked. And honestly, I, I actually threatened to leave unless I could bring in a placement person. So we a dedicated placement person. So we did. And, I think uh, that's that's the biggest downfall of a lot of the. There's a lot of really good quant programs out there, mm -hmm. but the job placement is so terrible. Yeah. That it kind of offsets the program, right? It's like you pay a lot of money, seventy, eighty, hundred thousand dollars for a degree, and then they can't place you. And I find the same thing. I'm going to these universities saying, "Hey, you know, I'll help you guys." prepare your students for interviews and prepare resume writing. And a lot of them are like, we don't really need it. We don't really care. We're not really yeah. interested. We're just basically yeah, getting that paycheck and collecting tuition for it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so um, the like placement in quantitative finance is actually like a, a niche area. Like there's people who do it and uh, they're few and far between. Okay, mm -hmm. so, you know, so, so actually, like when I first arrived at NYU, the, the NYU wide placement office is called Wasserman, they, they um, assigned someone to sort of cover the department that I chair. And it was a 22 year old kid, okay, and uh, with no experience in um, quantitative finance at all, you know, he had sort of an HR background. And, um, 
you know, and I said, this is hopeless. I and mean, this guy has no contacts, you know, no, doesn't know what they're looking for, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so that was when I threatened to quit to be honest. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, said, you know, we got to get somebody who knows what they're doing. So, and there are people and, um, you know, I admit it's hard to get those people to, let's say necessary to move to, um, to places that are not financial centers, but, um, you know, but in this day and age with Zoom, like we're doing now, um, you know, you can still hire someone act as a consultant, no matter where they are. And um, so I don't think there's an excuse to not have someone whose uh, sort of role is to coach people on, on, you know, what it takes to, to land a summer internship, which was, which is actually the primary way that people get full-time jobs. Right. right. So, and it has been since for the last 10, I'd say last eight years or so. <clears throat> yeah. Since do the you, crisis. Do you mind sharing a little bit about the application process? I know a lot of students sure. have kind of this picture. They think like somehow you have like your, you know, your GPA, your GRE score, your GMAT score, and then magically like they just sort you by that. Would you mind talking about more of the actual details that go on behind the scenes for these programs? Sure. Yeah, well, we do use those things, and um, they're often they're basically an initial screen. Um, but besides them, we ask for a video essay. Um, so we, you know, and we use that um, basically to see how well people communicate. Um, most of our student body is international, and um, I mean, this year we reached a high of 10% of our student body being American. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's shocking, to be honest with you. <laughs> it, yeah. That's so, really high. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, so often for, with these international students, English is a second language. And um, even if they do reasonably well on the verbal GRE, um, we want to see basically how well do they really communicate, not well, how to, not just how do they score on verbal GRE. And um, so the video essay is, is used for that purpose. And, um, and um, so as you know, there's a statement of purpose. That's kind of like, you know, we're checking that also for communication. Um, and um, we're also trying to be, you know, more diverse in several ways. So first, uh, we have yet to get more than half the student body being female, so we do lean a little bit towards towards talented women and there are many um we um you know we're also we are trying to get the american component up so we lean that direction as well <laughs> okay and um so and um underrepresented minorities um uh, so african americans etc cetera, etc cetera, you know, they, they'll get i mean we'll you know we realize they've had oh um, i guess i'm um, given the usual affirmative action argument that they've had a tilted playing field we want to tilt the other way so, so, um, so those those do enter into our thinking, and I think that's fair to say that's true of all programs. Um, we, um, you know, so we're. I can say what we're also not looking for. We're not looking for finance training. We're not looking for experience. Um, we're, you know, we feel we'll we'll give you the the finance training, and um, <clears throat> is. Experience is a good thing, but it's not a required thing. So, I mean, you think that, you know, in an MBA, you may know that the typical thing is like four years average work experience, and we don't have anywhere near that in our, in these quant finance programs. Mm-hmm. And that's okay, because being quantitative, there'll be less, there'll be less years away from when they first learn calculus and statistics. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, you demand four years work experience, often they're not using those things, especially calculus. Let's yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. And, uh, you know, so, so, uh, you know, we're able to use calculus and statistics and do heavily in our teaching and let's say they understand what we're doing. And so, so by not requiring work experience. <clears throat> right. So, um, so I'd say, um, I, I feel that our criteria are pretty close to the norms for quantitative finance. Um, mm-hmm. So um, <clears throat> we, you know, the program directors actually meet once a year in New York at the IAQF Career Fair. Mm-hmm. And um, this year, because of COVID, we didn't. But, you know, that's been going on every year for a long time. And I think that does lend a cohesiveness to practices. 
Um, so people, you know, so program directors do talk to each other and find best practices and tend to behave fairly similarly and in a good way. Um, so, um, so, um, so it's, I think that quantitative finance is actually blessed by having the sort of competing MBA and now master's of data science programs. Okay. Uh, which means, you know, there's sort of a, those competing programs basically, you know, do lead to a sense of cooperation among program directors. Okay. So those are over, I mean, like, um, <clears throat> you know, we could be, if we're not careful, I mean, these, especially the sort of the masters in data science and machine learning programs could easily eat our lunch. Um, <clears throat> but um, I always tell people that, and I believe this, that if you are competing, if you want, if you know you want a finance job, then you're better off doing a quant finance program with machine learning than a pure machine learning program where they teach no finance. Because, you know, mm -hmm. you are, you are, and the real, the real reason is, is because you have to remember who's doing the interviewing. And um, the person doing the interviewing is somebody who's like a grizzled Wall Street veteran who's not gonna know a lot of machine learning and is gonna know a lot of finance and, you know, are obviously gonna ask what they know, not what they don't know. Right. So, you know, so, um, so I think it's, you know, it's a tricky business. It's, but I do think, I actually do think industry awards people who are fairly diverse, let's call it shallow and diverse rather than very specialized and deep. Okay, so um, I think if, you know, the reason I was reporting to people with bachelor's and master's degrees is they were what I would call, you know, broad and shallow rather than narrow and deep, okay? Right. Um, and, you know, and that's actually what does rise to the top <clears throat> in organizations. Um, so people who are, you know, willing to just learn enough about a whole lot of different things. So, <clears throat> and um, so then, you know, when you're doing a master's degree, different master's degrees are different. They can be narrow and deep as well, or they can be comprehensive. I think, you know, an MBA is, is, is very comprehensive. I have an MBA, I feel like I'm speaking from experience and, you know, I was introduced to organizational behavior classes and marketing classes and you know, I never used them, but at least, uh, you know, I know what they are. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, I, I think, to succeed in quantitative finance though, you now do have the opportunity to have masters, to get a master's degree in it, thank God. It's a new, you know, it's a fairly new thing. It only came out in the mid nineties. Mm -hmm. It turns out NYU was actually the first um, quantitative finance master's program. Um, and, um, and so, um, so it's, it's fortunate that, um, you know, that this field has evolved and um, think, and the other thing that you know needs to be known from outs for outsiders is that it's it's not like homogeneous as one subject. Like it's you know it's so called P and Q, but you know there's so many other things too. Like you know so many different parts of math and computer science do come in. Um, so um, and that's the attractive thing if you like you know if you like seeing lots of different parts of math. In computer science being applied, so um, so I, that always appealed to me. That you know, so let's say, although my own undergrad degree was a bachelor of commerce, didn't allow me to get very deep in any math field. It at least um, allowed me to be exposed to different, at a shallow level, to different math fields. So um, so I knew they existed, and I could you know, let's say, push on them, and. Um, so, um, you know, quantitative finance draws on, okay, calculus, obviously, probability, linear algebra, statistics. Um, <clears throat> I've been applying abstract algebra recently in some recent research, which is not a typical thing. Um, and um, so it's nice that um, s people with so many different math or computer science backgrounds can actually contribute to quantitative finance. It's, I think it's a fascinating you know, intellectual enterprise. Um, 
getting all these different people with different skill sets to like work together towards a common good is um, is not an easy thing when you're a manager. Uh, Do you ever worry about though quantitative finance losing its meaning? Because I see a lot on the industry side, right? We have all these people applying and they say, hey, I'm a financial engineering graduate. You know, I'm an MBA graduate. And we look at them and it's like what they think quantitative finance is, mm -hmm. what they're teaching you in the MBA programs. And it's like, it's great that you understand, right, economics and you have these theories and you, you're doing, you know, factor models and they do all these exciting business terms. But when we're getting down to the nitty gritty, it's like we need them to be able to do actual math and testing. Yeah, and I think the MBA side, I'm actually upset with the MBA side because I feel like they're pushing over and convincing all these students that have these skills, which is fine. They're making money off of it. But on the industry side, I'm upset now saying, hey, I'm hiring these students and they don't have the basic one-on-one skills. They went out and memorized like this interview prep, which is great. But then at the end of the day, they don't have, they don't have quant finance. And I mean, I have a yeah. buddy of mine got an MBA and he took Python and it was how to download data from online. And that was deemed as, you know, he's a Python programmer now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So yes, I agree. Uh, so um, the, you know, so um, a funny thing happened uh, like, like along these lines. So um, Cornell has a campus on Roosevelt Island now, which is just outside Manhattan. And um, they, you know, normally they're in Ithaca and um, they decided it was um, the engineering school like is there on Roosevelt Island. And they thought, oh, wouldn't it be good to also have some MBAs? Um, and then the engineers and the MBAs could work together. And wouldn't that be great, you know, to, to sort of bring both the business sense and the engineering sense together. So, you know, so they tried it and it was a complete disaster because, you know, basically, you know, honestly, the MBAs said, okay, you do this <laughs> and I'll share credit. Okay. You know, and like the engineers said, well, why should I share credit with you? I'm doing the work. So, you know, so yeah. it just didn't work. And, um, so, um, I do think it's extremely important to, you know, get your hands dirty. Um, and, um, as when you're, you know, when you're doing the master's degree, because let's say the other thing is you can fail without consequence, really. Um, you right. know, you may get a low grade, but that's not such a deep consequence. They, they um, give you a B minus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, big <You> know, deal. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's, a, you know, it's a it's fantastic. Like, I, I know it's, you know, I, I tell people that, you know, you've got this fundamental conflict, which is that, you sort of, you know, you want to appear smart and at the same time, you're not, you don't know anything. Okay. And so, so, you know, so, so, you know, so what do you do? Right. I mean, if you sort of reveal your ignorance, I mean, that's not good. Uh, <laughs> but I tell them to reveal their ignorance. Like I just say, this is the chance. Like you're only going to get it when you're kind of like, um, you know, a master's student or, or maybe a doctoral student too. But, you know, once you're sort of out there in the real world and people are doing performance assessments, you know, then it's a lot more dangerous to, quote, reveal your ignorance, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, um, so I sort of take the view that you should reveal your ignorance early when you're just a student. Um, you know, it's not good for your ego, but it is good for harnessing, you know, intellectual wherewithal. And, um, you know, it'll pay off in the long run. So, um, so it's... But, you know, that's, I mean, that was the choice I made, honestly, when I was doing my PhD. Um, I came in unprepared and, um, you know, I kind of knew it. And um, so I just sort of said, well, they're not going to think much of me, but I'm going to ask questions to get answers. <laughs> and, stuff. and, you know, and uh, so, so that was what I did. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I felt it paid off. It's the only way you can really, you know, master a field. It's, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, admit that you don't know it and um, and um, admit to all, you know, and I mean, people are generally pretty friendly, especially in academia. <clears throat> yeah, for yeah. the most part. Yeah. 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 In academia, I mean. So <clears throat> so, I mean, MBA programs are in a crisis. Uh, they were, you know, they were king <laughs> of the hill for a long time. Um, yep. you know, and um, like, for example, like I have a long background with Karant's master's in math finance program, which is NYU math department. And um, actually when they started it, they actually went over to the Stern business school at NYU and said, Hey, you want to do this um, math finance program together? Uh, you know, you guys know the finance, we know the math. Wouldn't it be great to have a joint math finance program? 
And basically the dean of the Stern School at the time said, go away, we've got the MBA, it's very successful. We just wanna focus on that. You can do math finance all by yourself, no problem with us. So that's what Courant did. Yeah. And um, you know, they, they, they've developed a very good program. And, um, you know, and then you know, the world changed. I mean, basically computers got more powerful, quantitative methods also just became you know, more sophisticated. Um, you know, data became more available and, um, you know, MBA programs kind of realized, you know, a bit too late the folly of their ways. So they're, they're introducing quantitative finance type degrees through business school, through even through, you know, courses in MBA programs. But if they continue to demand four years work experience on average and, you know, a, a wide variety of undergraduate degrees, then they're never going to be able to really push through, you know, what they're trying to do. So, so, you know, competing against quant finance master's degrees that understand that they're really only going to accept people with technical degrees and with no experience. And, you know, it's going to be a continuation of their undergrad degree basic. Well, except that they're going to learn the finance part of it that they didn't necessarily have to have. Right. Right. <laughs> I've been working on a video recently on that because I feel like the MBAs, like you're saying, right. They're failing because finance is diverging. So like mm -hmm. investment banking is still solely, you know, traditional finance. There's not a lot of data yeah. and programming and math and stats, but we do see like that huge piece of Wall Street is kind of leaving. And yet the MBAs, I think, which I'll end up making a full video on it, but they need to refocus on what are you really good at? Mm -hmm. and like you mentioned, right? They're good at those broad skills, being able to see the marketing department and HR and managing the quants and seeing the whole picture. But now they're trying to do that where we want to cover everything, but we're going to cover something very specialized, which is quant finance. Yeah. And I don't think you can do it. And Michigan had Michigan's original financial engineering program, which I was started in, they had that mm -hmm. same problem. The Ross Business School was running the show and then engineering was fighting with them and they couldn't make it work. Mm -hmm. and it was like the finance side, the, the MBA program wanted more and more and more traditional finance. And it's like, that's helpful to an extent, but you really mm -hmm. need those math and stats so I think the MBA programs, I think they're going to be, they're going to continue yeah. to lose numbers until they start refocusing back on this is our goal. This is what we're good at. We need to let go of that kind of quantum piece. Yeah. I mean, a way of, of categorizing it is um, like in quant finance, you're often learning how to do things. Okay. And um, in economics, the question isn't so much how, but why. So um, you're trying to understand why the world is as it is. And it's a, you know, they're both valid. I mean, I'm not saying one is better than the other, but they are different. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, in getting your first job, it's actually more important to know how than to know why. I mean, it's great to know both, I grant, but, you know, the human brain is limited capacity. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, what you're really saying is, you know, I think one way of categorizing it is, you can hire an MBA who knows why, or you can hire a quant who knows how. And unfortunately, the entry level job is for somebody who knows how. Okay. And, you know, so, you know, that's in a nutshell, you know, also what I did at NYU is switch the program from answering why questions to answering how questions. And, um, you know, it's, you know, it helped placement. And then with the heavy, heavy uh, weight on placement that held rankings and then it self-fulfills then well, once you have good rankings good students apply and uh, you get into a good equilibrium which is you know an economics concept and so i know why uh, we're uh, you know we're able to attract good students now okay <clears throat> so do you do you agree with the way the rankings are done uh, well, there's three different rankings and they're done differently so um, but they have a lot of commonality and they um, the, this, this, I do agree with the emphasis on placement. Um, one thing they're missing that I think they could all do, except they're too lazy is, um, is interview students is to, you know, so, so right now the three rankings I'm thinking of have you know, don't have student input at all. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, and other rankings of other programs like us news ranks and the MBA programs, for example, things like that. Um, or Business Week does MBA programs. They do ask students, and you know, obviously, you know, one answer is like students can just game it. But you know, it's a you're trying to distinguish, so it's hard to believe. You know, if everybody if everybody games equally, it doesn't really matter that they all game it. And um, so, 
And um, I do think though that, you know, the reality is that you know, students who are frustrated by let's say career services and so on are not necessarily gonna play ball and just say, oh, this is a great program just because you know, they're told that this will help them down the road. So, so, um, so I do think they should consider interviewing students, you know, getting student input. That's one thing they're missing. Um, and, um, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, the, again, the three programs do differ and like, like some of them make rookie mistakes. Like, for example, looking at cohort size, I think is a, as a, as a measure of quality is by itself stupid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to use that word. Okay. Yeah. Um, whereas class size, which sounds the same, but is a completely different concept, uh, which is the number of students on average in a class is important. Okay. So, right. um, and, you know, so there's like, you know, some of the, some of the rankings were only recently introduced and they made rookie mistakes, which they then corrected. So, um, but I mean, I do think the other thing that you know, rankings need to realize is that they're self-fulfilling. So, you know, you give a high rank to a program one year and then <laughs> next year they have, suddenly they have good students. And so you give a high, you put weight on that, you know? And so, yeah. so you kind of end up, you know, creating your own product. <clears throat> um, well, um, you know, no ranking system is perfect. And obviously there's a lot of controversy um, no matter who's doing the rankings. And, and also like an issue is there's no auditing. And, um, you know, so basically all three just rely on, let's call it the um, morals of um, people submitting <laughs> data, which is, you know, uh, can be a dangerous business, let's face it. So, yeah. so, you know, so in choosing criteria, I mean, what you should do is choose objective criteria. So like an, an example would be um, that, um, like I mentioned this once in a post on your site yeah. that, okay, I mean, this is self-serving, but I'll say it anyway, that if you look at citations of faculty, at least it's not something that can be gamed. Okay, it's something that Google collects, not, you know, they can be checked by anyone. So um, if you instead um, just sort of say, you know, ask um, what's your placement rate and do zero auditing of it, then, um, you know, obviously um, you'll get, I mean, you'll, everybody who's an insider knows that um, there are programs that just kind of like exaggerate mm -hmm. on this, knowing full well, they're not going to be audited. And, you know, so they'll, they'll even come out with a hundred percent placement rate. And then all you have to do is like, go to, um, go to LinkedIn and you'll see, graduates of that program searching for jobs and go, yep. you know, it's, yep. it's, they, they started emailing me and contacting me for jobs. And I was looking at the placement rankings thinking like it says a hundred percent and yet your yeah. students are still contacting me, telling me they love your program, but yet they can't get placed. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so that's an obvious flaw of putting like of putting a lot of weight on placement and then not auditing. Okay. So it's a combination of the two. Yeah. I mean, um, I wanted to do rankings and I, I thought about doing rankings and everybody wanted me to start ranking programs. Mm -hmm. And then I decided to review Michigan's program just because I'm an alumni. I thought it'd be fun to go up there anyways. And I went through like an entire process of sitting in classes, talking to students, talking to professors, right? Trying to get all that, the different angles. But yeah. like you mentioned before, it's a lot of work, right? Someone's going to have yeah, to do all that work. You'd have to yeah, get the feedback from the students to really get an honest review of the program. Yes. Um, so, well, I'd say you're actually as more qualified, I would think, than the people currently doing it. <laughs> okay. Uh, although they have a fair bit of experience now, but, um, you know, you having gone through such a program is definitely going to help. And um, the, um, you know, it is a lot of work, but it's also perhaps a lot of benefit if you, you know, like, you know, so U.S. News you know, it's business week, let's switch to business week. I know that they're the issue that, you know, has the most sales is the one where they rank the MBA programs. And um, so, you know, so they, they get their payoff. Um, and, um, you know, you'll, 
you'll get a lot of headaches like program directors like me complaining <laughs> if you don't do it carefully <laughs> but uh you know it um i would let's say i would personally welcome a um a fresh look at it and um you know get you know perhaps take getting student input it could be graduates input you know if it's if it's already somebody who's got a job then um they perhaps you know be a little more objective i'd say than a student who's currently in the program um right so <clears throat> yeah so um so you can survey alums um and um i mean the other thing is some of them do peer assessment so they ask program directors to rank other program directors programs <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of this but yeah yeah i'm not either um the reason is i think that past rankings you know end up affecting peer assessment too much and also you know it's just i mean aside from that one meeting a year i mean you know the, the you don't actually see these programs in action so you feel unqualified Right. to actually judge them, you know? Yeah, there so, was there was one of the directors that I've known who's been extra chummy with different program directors because other directors yeah. I've talked to from other programs have mentioned, oh, this person's great, wonderful. And yet when I started digging more into the program, it's like they didn't have the same rigor as other programs. Mm -hmm. And yet their rankings were done really well. And it's like, your students keep coming to me complaining and then you guys keep getting ranked higher. And then it's like the peer to peer piece. I'm looking at it thinking, so people think you're, you're an amazing director, but it's like your students don't agree with that. Yeah. But I think it definitely, yeah, it does get flawed, right? If you see a program number one, number two, every year, it's like, they must be an amazing program, but it's like, yeah, you're not getting to go to sit in their class and go through the lectures and talk to the students and get that real well-rounded kind of position on it. Yeah. The other issue with peer assessment is it can be gamed and um, you know, like there's no, there's no feedback mechanism to keep people honest. So, so, <clears throat> um, so there's a ton of noise in rankings, and some of it can be addressed, um, but um, by changing, you know, by changing the criteria. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, it is, you know, I do see the, you know, we play ball. We <laughs> we uh, submit the data to all three you ask, and we would you know, if a credible agency came to us, including you, and asked, uh, we would we would play ball. So, because, um, you know, we do see the uh, value for outsiders. Um, but at the same time, like, you know, just philosophically, you know, the person putting together the rankings has to assign weights. And that weighting scheme is just, you know, not necessarily appropriate to to the people making the decision, right? So right. Um, doing more than just providing a cardinal ordering is um, is definitely should be you know it should be and is part of the information reveal. So uh, that people who are really into making a smart move can compile their own rankings by placing their own weightings on what's important to them. Okay. Right. Right. That's so, a good idea. Yeah. 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 You should be able, you know, to to allow people to do that. And um, that boils down to, you know, what are the, what are the criteria? Because if you're, <clears throat> so, um, you know, so, you know, I, I just keep coming back to the criteria should be objective, that um, you shouldn't rely too much on people being honest about their own weaknesses. <laughs> okay. <Right>. Uh, <laughs> it's not a recipe for success. No. <laughs> Right. All right. Oh, so, so let's wrap this up here with a kind of a final topic area here. What do, what do you think on online learning? I know you guys are doing more of it. Um, I know you're involved with world quant. Yeah. I, I made a video on it <laughs> a while yeah. back and I take a lot of heat on not being the biggest fan of it. Okay. But what, what are your thoughts here on where do you see the industry going? Do you see more programs going to online only, or just adding that more as kind of that option of course in COVID here? Okay. Yeah. So, um, all right. Yeah. I'm on the board of world quant first. I want to, as you said, and, um, I joined it because I guess I, I do see online as having a role. Um, so similarly at NYU I'm on the oversight committee for online education, uh, for the Tandon school of engineering. And, um, 
And, um, you know, we introduced uh, a Coursera course, uh, machine learning that anybody can take for no cost. And um, we just introduced an edX course as well. And um, so, so we um, like, you know, a common refrain that you'll hear from program directors is that online could like eat into their sort of regular bread and butter physical attendance programs. And um, I, you know, and that could happen if it's not done carefully, but I think you can do it carefully and not have that happen. So, so we tended, we, we made our online offerings appeal to a different segment than our bread and butter, you know, segment that attends. So it could be people with experience who are executive, busy executives, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they're usually not going to drop everything and go back and get, spend a year and a half or two years getting a master's degree. And um, so um, the, you know, like it's pretty well known that uh, some subjects lend themselves to being taught online and others don't, you know, let's say English probably doesn't, computer science probably does. And I think quant finance is closer to computer science than English. So, so it probably does. And um, so that's a plus. And um, the, I think that, um, I like the, um, so, so personally, I do a lot of online learning. I have to say, I use YouTube in particular because I like the flexibility it offers, um, that, um, and, uh, I've learned a lot of math through YouTube and, um, and, um, you know, the, just the ability to animate is, is, can be very important for certain concepts. So, um, so I am you know, a believer in the value of online. I don't feel it'll ever fully replace in-person teaching. Um, you know, it's like the technology has actually been around for a long time and it hasn't replaced in-person teaching. So I'm not alarmed and, um, by it in any way. Um, the, um, you know, so the, the, this fall at NYU, we kind of introduced a third mode. So you know, the two previous modes were fully in person, fully online. And now we've got this third mode called hybrid where, you know, you're teaching some students in the room and there are others who are um, attending um, via Zoom. And um, that format I think is terrible. (laughs) I think think it'll never last. I think it'll be over as soon as the vaccine is out. And, um, you know, a lot of people agree with me. What, what, What doesn't work well with it? What, yeah, okay. Um, it's it's mostly a te- uh, it's mostly a technological problem right now, I think. Uh, so, um, and the students who are remote sort of complain that they're not getting a quality experience um, from the person who's just teaching to the mostly to the people who are in the room, mm-hmm. and um, it's just very difficult also for the professor all by themselves to keep track of two audiences, or you could even argue more than two if you consider the different remote people as different. So, um, and so um, I, I have yet to see it done successfully. I don't, you know, maybe premature to say it's hopeless as I am kind of saying, but, um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, there, you know, an alternative would be you only, you drop the synchronous remote part. So you teach the students physically in the room, you record it, that's that's okay being recorded and then other students could just watch it asynchronously. But trying mm-hmm. to get the synchronous and online component together is is just not very easy. You yeah, know, so I, I did a presentation a few weeks back mm-hmm. and it was like an online chat, which was fine and I'm teaching technical material. But the issue I had is that you start having the window popping up as the online people are asking questions yeah. And then trying to say like, okay, I have to stop the presentation for everybody and then trying to read the questions off and then trying to get back to that yeah. presentation. For me, it was just hard. I think recording it, it and then having it just play for people to watch is great, but it, it was really hard being an instructor trying to teach it and then also trying to cater to those online questions and fields. As yeah. we run. It may be a two person job. I mean, maybe you need two professors or, or the TA and the professor to, yeah. to deal with it. Um, so, so uh, anyway, but I do think, um, let's say now everybody's familiar with zoom. It will, 
um, encourage people to, you know, record every class so that people can watch it um, after. And even like it's encouraged people to do the opposite, the flipped classroom. So, so I think you know, we're going to see more penetration of online, let's say, but not to 100 percent. And um, um, <clears throat> I know, um, you know, it's also interesting to speculate whether other, like, let's say, the big four tech firms will sort of enter higher education and try to just, you know, completely like <laughs> overturn the standard mechanism. Um, you know, I, some people speculate that'll happen, but I don't think it'll happen. Um, they're not interested. It's not, it's, I don't think it's that profitable for one thing. I think yeah. their current lines of businesses are more profitable. So um, right. also, you know, there's government regulation when it comes to teaching more than they're used to. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> and it's in the US, it's done state by state. So you have to like, you know, if you, um, you might have to deal with multiple state entities. So it's not very attractive. Do you guys ever worry about cheating on exams for online? Yes, I mean, it's a huge issue. I mean, and, um, you know, I don't like, you know, so there are software solutions, right? Like ProctorU and um, where, so they don't work perfectly, but you know, let's say the gist of it is that, you know, students have a camera on them as they're doing a test and um, it doesn't work perfectly because um, more well Hill students could let's say have a second computer behind the first computer and, and uh, cheat that way. And so there are issues. And um, so we've, because of COVID at NYU basically said, try to switch away from high stakes exams and um, emphasize more take home, um, take home exams or projects. And, um, you know, that's, you know, the thinking being you know, this COVID is not forever, thank God, and uh, we'll um, <laughs> get back to, you know, the usual sort of in-class exam, but with proctoring, so just, you know, less cheating anyway. Right. Um, so I do think it's a huge issue, and everybody I talk to agrees, actually. So it's, and, um, you know, I have a daughter in college, and I know she doesn't cheat, and I feel that, you know, she, she, her grades could be better as a result <laughs> because others are cheating and, you know, the professor can't do anything about it. And it just, so, yeah. so, you know, they put it on a curve and, and that's what happens. So it's just, um, yeah. A sad yeah. Thing. For me, that's the biggest, I think, hurdle for hiring online students. Mm -hmm. So a lot of students are going on about online is great. It's wonderful. And I'm like, I agree, right? Because I do like you. I like to go on YouTube and I watch different YouTube channels and I go through examples and try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like it's so easy to cheat online. It's really hard for practitioners to say, yeah, we're going to pay you, I mean, six figures to come in here. And then you show up and then it's like all of a sudden you don't know what you're doing. And there's always kind of hesitation I think, from the industry. So I always, I think, I don't think online will eventually replace it. Because I think that exam piece of it's kind of an important aspect of the learning, learning components. Yeah. I mean, at Morgan Stanley, they would give a test in person um, to um, anybody who wanted to apply to be a quant. Um, it was a written test and it was sort of proctored, so to speak, um, by HR people. <laughs> and um, so, um, you know, they did that to address the issues you raise. And um, so, and they still do it as far as I know. So it's um, <clears throat> just a um, very real problem um, that will, uh, you know, let's say, so, I mean, world quant, um, getting back to that, um, you know, it's, you have to appreciate their mission. It's not really to, um, you know, compete with um, current standard quant finance programs, even though it's called quant data finance. Um, but they're, they're really just trying to reach people in third world countries who don't earn enough income to pay the tuition that is, you know, charged by programs like NYU, I'll say it. Yeah. So, so, um, so, you know, it, it is kind of a humanitarian effort. And, um, you know, I, I think they, they try to be upfront that all you're getting is an education. You're not getting placement help. Uh, you know, there's no tuition. You, you, I don't know if you're aware of that. World yeah, doesn't uh, charge tuition at all. 
And, um, you know, it's really just for people who want to learn the material and they should appreciate that just having learned the material, there's still going to be a gargantuan task in terms of getting a job to use it. Um, Right. And, uh, and, and I've, rec- I've actually recommended it to students because I have students that contact me and like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm in Africa somewhere. Mm-hmm. There's no way I have the money to even fly to the U.S. and then to pay tuition and all that. So I do recommend it to students, but I think it's, I guess, yeah, the, the gripe, I, yeah, yeah, the yeah, gripe I, I have with it is the name. Don't call it Quant. <laughs> Don't call it Quant yeah. World, World Quant, because it, it's just missing that level. And I've talked to students who graduated and they said it was amazing. They said it's definitely not a quant degree, but they said mm-hmm. it got them in these amazing analytical jobs in their country. And they said, nobody else had the skill. So it really prepared them for those jobs. Yeah. I feel like they need to do a better job on their end of just being more honest with this is what we are. Yeah. There's, there's a whole world out there that needs it. Right. And I agree. I think it's a great program. It's really helping, but I've taken a lot of flack on YouTube for, uh, <laughs> for reviewing it, but I, I do think it's good. I definitely think if you're in that demographic, it's the best option out there for them. Yeah. Um, the largest cohort is last I checked was from Nigeria. And, um, you know, and um, I think it, I like that these ideas are sort of getting out there to the broader world. And, um, you know, eventually those people will, um, you know, not only get their first job in their country, but will rise to the ranks. And, you know, we'll see these quantitative finance techniques being used by the minister of finance of a country, uh, that's a good thing. Okay, because let's say the way it's done now could be very haphazard. So, um, so, um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it is, I know that, you know, obviously it's all run by one company and they're very, they're pretty careful to, to, not hire the graduates themselves for, you know, they won't hire them for a year until at least a year has passed. And um, so as uh, <clears throat> they're not cherry picking the pool and, you know, I've been to several board meetings. I mean, they're, they're really trying to do it as professionally as they can. Um, so it's, you know, as long as it's understood that it's fairly different um, from anything else, because it's, you know, and, it's the only, it's fair to say it's the only free accredited and online master's right. degree in quantitative finance. Those words are all <laughs> completely accurate. It's getting accredited to be perfectly clear. Uh, it's in the process of getting accredited. So, so, um, so it is what it is. And um, I don't think they're trying to mislead anybody. Do you, do you get any feedback on their uh, curriculum? Cause I mean, I reviewed it like three yeah. years ago, so I'm sure it's, it's evolving and changing and, improving over time. Yeah, well, they want to move it in the machine learning direction. And so they actually, um, but it turns out you can't change the curriculum too dramatically when you're going through the accreditation process. So they're Makes sense. Sort of a, a temporary hurdle, um, meaning once they get accredited, then it's, it's actually easier to change the curriculum. And um, so sort of what they've actually done is to move in the machine learning direction and sort of offer like a certificate on the side kind of thing. So, so anyway, so there, um, you know, many of the instructors come from the company and are well, you know, let's say they're for our practitioners and that's a good thing. Um, it's also, you know, a pretty big company. So it has a pretty diverse body of employees to draw on and very international. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, thing so um it's an experiment and um you know it's hard to compare against anything else because it's so different and um you know as a board member and we're just kind of trying to let them know what's what's out there and what's happening but um that's all you can really do so um but you know if the goal is to get a job on wall street then you're not going to go to world quant for that and it's like, you know, that's fair to say. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, All right. thank you for uh, coming on the channel. It's been great talking to you. My pleasure. Uh, thank you for having me.